Yeah, welcome everyone to today's FinRob interdisciplinary lecture series. My talk today is entitled Genome Editing and its Impacts in Plant Breeding and Crop Physiology Studies. Uh, before I start, I would like to shortly say what I'm going to talk about. So first I want to ask the question, why do we actually need plant breeding? I will then provide uh, milestones and examples of plant breeding and, and tell you about the impact of genome editing in, in plant breeding. So novel technology, genome editing. Then I will talk about at the end of about regulatory considerations and then depending on how much time I will still have also why genome editing, this novel technology is actually also a very important and helpful tool to study crop physiology. Now, do we, now why do we need uh, plant breeding? I think we are all aware that the world population is still growing. As of today, we are surpassing uh, 8 billion people on this planet. And what is maybe less, what people are maybe less well aware of, if you take this window, for example, that I indicate here by this by this bar, uh, where we have this steep increase in, in population growth, we see actually a positive development with respect to the prevalence of undernourishment. So basically, hunger has actually gone down as population went up. Yeah? And of course, it's not where we want it to be. So there's still in, in 21 an estimate of 690 million people suffering from hunger by the FAO is still too much. Currently, actually, in the last one or two years, also, it, it seems there's an increase again in hunger, which is very unfortunate, probably caused by the uh, corona pandemic, but also by uh, very bad weather events, but also by the by Russia's war in Ukraine, of course. But, but overall, this, this trend has been positive, and it has been paralleled and caused by an increase in cereal production. And the point that I want to make here is that this increase in cereal production has been not caused by an increase in land use, yeah, which would have been bad, but actually by an increase in cereal yield. And there's always two components that actually, actually can increase uh, yield. So one is management, that could be input of fertilizer, of pesticide, but also crop management, such as um, crop rotations, for example. And then there's another component, which is breeding. And, and there's actually very nice work from breeding programs in, in Germany and breeding uh, variety, basically, um, panels in, in Germany. These are mentioned here, these two publications. One of them, this Nature Plant paper in 2019, was co-authored from two colleagues here in Bonn, Jens Leon and Agenbal Warren. And they actually nicely showed that, and this is especially now, if you think about an industrialized country like, like uh, Germany, where pesticide and, and fertilizer use is, is not a limitation, let's say, since the 60s, it shows very nicely that the breeding, uh, basically, that the increase in cereal yield is mostly and largely due to increased and improved breeding. Yeah? So breeding has been very important, actually. This is shown here for wheat yield, for example, uh, in, in industrialized countries and, and, and also worldwide. Yeah? And so um, the question is, do we still need uh, breeding in future? And I would say, as we are increasing our world population, I think we need, and not only to to, of course, provide the calories, but I think, I, and I hope I can convince you today also because of many other aspects of, of increasing uh, crop uh, quality, but also uh, diminishing the footprint of agriculture. Now, there are many aspects about how to get there to, to, um, to feed an increasing world population. And, and I think most of you will be well aware that there's a, basically a higher uh, footprint of land use uh, if we think about animal-based food as compared to plant-based food. So basically, um, planetary health diet, as recommended by the uh, Eat Lancet Commission, uh, which is basically a diet that is both healthy for, for people and for the planet, will actually make a big contribution, of course, in, in, in being able to, to produce the amount of crops that we need to, to produce fibrous food and, and feed and so on for an increasing world population. But it still puts actually crop production into focus. Yeah? And breeding, I think, remains important. So now, if you think about breeding, we, of course, talk about domesticated plants, yeah, because these are uh, central to field the world population. And what seems a little bit like a very diverse panel of different cultivated plants is actually not as diverse as it could be. Yeah? So from approximately 400,000 vascular plants that we have on our planet, and of which 80,000 are edible, only about 150 actually are cultivated today. And maybe, maybe more, uh, also important, yeah, so four of these crops that are highlighted here, so the, the big players, corn, potato, wheat, and, and rice, these four basically crops, they provide about half the calories that uh, that is con that are consumed actually on a worldwide uh, uh, level. Yeah, and so the question that I have now is actually how how did 
these domesticated plants actually, how did they arrive? How did we get there, basically? And so you're probably well aware that the domestication process, depending on, on crop, has been uh, has happened actually quite a long time ago, between like 5,000 and then 12,000 years, depending on crop, ago. And um, and the question that I have now is what actually happened during this domestication process? Yeah. And then, uh, and so in one example, for example, where we have the wild type progenitor, like in, in the case of maize, where we know that Teosinte, the wild plant Teosinte, gave rise to this, this domesticated crop. There has been, of course, as you can see from the slides, there has been a number of changes in order yeah, to get to a plant where you have big ears, kernels, and so that could yeah, like, like nourish a family. And so the question is, what happened there? And in simple terms, actually, there is a combination of two things. So one is spontaneous mutations that happen with quite low frequency, and then human selection in order to get to these basically improved crops. And I like the definition by, by Dobley that the plant domestication is actually the genetic modification of a wild species to create a new plant altered to meet human needs. I think it very much actually meets and, and, and defines what a domesticated plant is. And, and so basically I want to go a little bit deeper and, and, and also in an abstract term, how do you actually get to these domesticated plants? Yeah? And so basically, if you think about how do how did our ancestors basically that, that were involved in this breeding process, how did they actually reach a certain breeding target? Yeah, and this is shown here. So basically, what you have is the breeding target, which could be crane size, it could be number of cranes, color, taste, pathogen resistance, something that they were interested in um, on the x-axis, and then the frequency of phenotypes on the y-axis. And you can imagine that on a given crop population, you have a distribution of different phenotypes. So now, if you select those very like close to your breeding target or closer to your breeding target, and you bring in the next generation, there's a chance that you will actually see that uh, there's a gain in breeding. Yeah, so that you get a breeding gain in the next generation. Yeah, and this genetic gain, as it also called, actually is a function of a, a number of parameters such as selection intensity. So how far do you put this window towards your breeding target? But also selection position. Yeah, how precisely can you really pick? bigger kernels or, or something like this. And then also, um, of course, genetic variants that I that I think is at the heart of what I want to show you. And if there's no genetic variants, as I will show you in the next slide, there's no uh, genetic gain to be made. Yeah? And then also generation time, if you have more breeding cycles, you can go faster, can recharge faster this, this, this genetic gain. Now, this is not a case where, so this I think is, is, is maybe quite obvious. Now, if you have actually a situation where you have no genetic variation, so basically an, an, uh, a crop that has that is basically completely, where all the, the, the alleles have fixed, there's no genetic variation, you still will get actually a distribution of phenotypes. Now, if you put your selection window again towards the breeding target, let's say bigger plants, bigger kernels or something like this, you go to next generation. If there's no genetic variance, you will actually, if you have an isogenic population, you will not make any breeding gain. Yeah? And so basically this means that in order to make breeding, you need genetic variants, you need genetic variation in your population. Yeah? So no genetic gain possible without genetic variants. And so basically now, how is actually the phenotype caused? Yeah? And so you could say that the phenotype is caused by both genotype and the environment, and also genotype and environment interactions. And from a molecular genetics perspective, actually, this is the phenotype can also be described as the consequence of a genetic flow of information from, from DNA to, to, to the phenotype that is influenced by the environment. Yeah, this is shown here. So basically, and, and the first yeah, a person who has actually proposed this flow of genetic information is Francis Crick in, in 1958. And so basically this means that you have a DNA that encodes, yeah, or some of the DNA at least, encodes for certain uh, proteins, and there's a messenger mRNA in between. Yeah? And so then protein is being made, proteins in part can have enzymatic functions that creates metabolites that all together basically will influence and, and, and determine also the phenotype. And all of this basically expression of DNA from transcription to translation, through translational modifications and so on, will actually be um, influenced in um, by the environment. And, and before I say this, there's of course not just one DNA, but for example, if you take a typical crop here like maize with 32,000 genes, you have 32,000 protein coding genes that will result in a high number of mRNA uh, diversity that is also caused by, for example, alternative splicing and other uh, um, processes and, and proteins that will also have a large variety because of post-translational modifications and then a number of metabolites in order to then actually finally result in this phenotype. And of course, genes also influence each other. So you have a genetic network, also some non-coding 
genes will actually have an influence on this, so it's quite complicated. And now this actually is all influenced at all levels of expression by the environment. And this then actually results in this genotype plus environment plus genotype and environment interactions. Huh? And so basically, um, this is actually regardless of the size of the gene. And genomes come in different sizes. I want to give you one example here. So your maze, for example, you have 2.4 giga bases, a billion bases. And I will tell you in a minute what bases are. This is similar to humans and pepper. And for example, in a, in a polyploid or hexaploid uh, uh, organism as, as bread wheat, you have even 17 uh, uh, giga bases. And what are these giga bases? This is actually referring now to the constitution of the DNA. So this is shown here. Maybe you have seen this somewhere already in, in, uh, in, in, from, from, you know, remember this from school, where your DNA is, is quite simply, actually, it's a quite simple structure. It contains four different nuclear bases called adenine, tumine, guanine, and cytosine. They are linked to each other yeah, in one strand here. This is one strand. This is an anti-sense strand, if you wish. They are linked by um, a sugar molecule. It's called deoxyribose and the phosphate. Yeah. They have a certain direction also. And the important point here is that there's only four different bases, A, G, C, T, regardless of organism. And always three of them encode, so three in a row, for example, here, C, A, G, they encode for one amino acid, which is part of the proteins that then do their job as, for example, enzymes, transporters, and so on. Yeah? And the C, A, G, in this particular case, encodes a glutamine, yeah? also sometimes abbreviated with one letter called Q. Now, um, what I want to actually point out again, that regardless of organism, humans, plants, bacteria, there's only four letters available to, code, to, to encode genetic information. Yeah? And so basically, if you print the whole genomic DNA of humans in a book, you will have, yeah, with this book that are shown here, you will have 130 volumes. It will be 95 years to read this. If you do this with wheat, which is, as I told you before, a larger genome, you will have 17, 12 volumes, 512 years to read. But again, the point that I want to make is, after hundreds of thousand years of human evolution or after several thousand years of uh, crop domestication, you will only have AGCT. And this is independent of how these actually mutations were introduced yeah, by which breeding technology or so. Always four letters based let you end up with. And there's a universal code yeah, that you might have also seen. This universal code has to be read from the inside to the outside. So always three letters, A, C, A, will encode a specific amino acid. And this is universal, also indicating that all organisms that live together on Earth are related to each other and derive from a single um, ancestral organism. Now, I want to point out what a mutation could look like. This could be spontaneous or induced. And so this is a, a, a protein coding DNA that I show here. And uh, so basically, the, the letter CAG, they will encode, if you look at this CAG, they will encode uh, glutamine. And so this then, actually, this glutamine can... Yeah, be part of a polypeptide chain that will form a three-dimensional protein, which could be a transporter involved in nutrient uptake. Now, there could be a single, um, and this is the amino acid that is shown here. And so basically, there could be a single nucleotide polymorphism, so a single mutation, where this um, C is changed here to an, to an A, where then basically you end up, you can look this up again in your genetic code, you will end up with a K, which is a short form for lysine. This lysine, um, sorry, this lysine then will basically, yeah, substitute the glutamine and then maybe yeah, it's a different amino acid, different properties, positive charge at one side and so on. And this will then actually result in a change in this final protein and may change your, the capacity, the ability of this transport and maybe the specificity of, of nutrient transport and maybe change the nutrient use efficiency of this organism, of this specific crop. Yeah? So this is how this works. And so basically, again, going back to this to this idea that genetic uh, a breeding target can only be reached if you have basically a genetic variance, all of the milestones in breeding, and I don't have time to talk all about them, I only want to talk about two, they actually in one way or another, they induce genetic variation or they take advantage of genetic variation in a very smart way. And, and this is actually then yeah, uh, something that, that has actually re resulted then in, 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 as we know today, breeding efforts that have actually had this, this huge consequences also to improve yields and, and crops, of course. Now, I want to, as I said before, I want to talk about two in particular because of time reasons. So one is mutagenesis or mutation breeding, as it's also sometimes uh, being called. And the other one is genome editing. And um, genome editing in some parts of the world is considered GMO technology. So basically are considered gen genetically modified organisms. And I want to shortly, because this, this uh, will come up also in this talk, tell you what actually has been 
or how genotic, genetically modified organism is defined by the European Union. Yeah? And so I read here loudly, so genetically modified organisms means an organism with the exception of human beings in which the genetic material has been altered in a way that does not occur naturally by mating and or natural recombination. Yeah? Okay. And so I want to go now first to the um, basically first yeah, mutation breeding or mutagenesis to the first technology that that uh, yeah that breeders have been doing since the 1950s. And so there are two main mutagens. Yeah, so we have chemical mutagens such as this uh, ethyl methan sulfonate, which is shown here. It's actually a chemical that, as far as we know, does not exist on our planet. It's a man-made chemical which is an alkylating reagent that alkylates DNA and then induces randomly mutations over the genome. It mostly actually um, changes or reduces GC to AT transitions, yeah, to point mutations. And then there's another physical mutagen. Yeah, this is a radio isotope 60 uh, cobalt, which is an isotope that is synthetically man, uh, made in nuclear facilities. Also, as far as we know, does not exist in our solar system even. And um, this is uh, basically produced by a neutron bombardment, which then results in an unstable nickel, uh, in an unstable cobalt, basically isotope, which then decays into nickel and emits beta radiation, an ele electron basically, and uh, also strong gamma radiation. And the gamma radiation then induces single strand and um, double strand breaks in DNA. Yeah? And in all cases, general several thousands of mutations per genome are induced. And the reason why breeders have done this is because spontaneous mutations that in most part are not uh, under, un distinguishable from these induced mutations, they occur just with low frequency. So in order to get more genetic variation, you, you use this mutagen, the mutagens. Yeah? Nevertheless, these are not regulated as GMO technology. And this again shows the uh, single and double strand breaks induced by gamma radiation. Okay, and this has been done since, since the 1950s. And actually there was actually also, there's a nice database that is uh, basically, um, I have a link here that is also supported by the, by the FAO. And um, where people can actually put the such radiation bred varieties into this database. And currently there are approximately three and a half thousand uh, uh, crop varieties in there. There's no obligation to put such breeding efforts into this database. Yeah, so it's a voluntary database. And I want to point one out here that is a barley variety, Trump, which is the parent of Alexis, which has been the dominant malting barley in Europe till 2006. And I say this because everybody who drinks beer will have basically used beer that has been brewed with the help of such a mutation bred uh, barley variety. And this is actually just one example. There are many more examples. So sweet corn, for example, has been bred by mutation breeding. Semi-dwarf mutants that are lodging resistant, have higher yield, virus resistant cacao, fungal resistant Japanese pear, grapefruit, which is seedless, has been bred by mutation breeding. A number of barley varieties, as I showed you before, but also, for example, durum wheat, yeah, which with higher yield and, and also different properties that have actually made it into the market. And these are basically um, um, items that 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 we, we can't escape, that are basically all around us, that have been made by mutation breeding. And again, there is no obligation for breeders to, to register this in databases, as I told you before. And, and the mutations that have been induced are indistinguishable from spontaneous mutations. So it would be also very hard to pinpoint which mutants have been actually generated by this. Now, it might be surprising to you why this is not regulated as GMO technology. I think it's most likely because, this is my personal view, because it would be very hard to track them, yeah? Because since the 1950s, breeders have been doing this. The reason by the by the by the, by the, by the, by, by the European Union is that organisms produced by classical mutagenesis using irradiation or chemical mutagenesis are GMOs. So they are genetically modified organisms, actually. So what, what we are eating on a daily basis, but they are exempted from the obligations of the GMO legislation due to a long history of safe use at the time of the introduction of the legislation in 2001. So I think this would be a nice point to discuss later after the seminar, what this actually means and, and why, why this is something that the lawmaker does. Now, in contrast to this, I want to now uh, present the next important uh, reading technology, which is genome editing. And there's a number of different techniques that actually have been under this umbrella of, of genome editing. Yeah? So there's zinc finger nucleases, TALENS, yeah, an acronym for transcription activation like effector nucleases, and then there's CRISPR-Cas9, so clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, CRISPR combined with a nuclease, and this 
case and in many cases Cas9 or other Cas-like enzymes. And this la la latest one, so this CRISPR-Cas9 system is actually an old bacterial defense system against viral DNA, so against phage infection. And the principle of all these different technologies is always the same. You have basically the physical recognition of a specific sequence, um, basically, and then this is combined with a nuclease, an enzyme that is actually able to cut DNA. Yeah? And for this to work, this breeding technology to work, you need to have information about the target sequence. If you don't know what target sequence you're looking at, you cannot use this breeding technology. Yeah? So this is the big contrast also to mutation breeding, of course. And so this is very, of course, has been made very famous, this, this CRISPR-Cas9 technology for ease of use, I guess, also, and for its potential, actually, to then make really, um, uh, to make precise mutations in, 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 in uh, organisms, and has been awarded the Nobel Prize for the important contribution to the discovery of the system to Emmanuel Charpentier and, and Jennifer Dudner, yeah, as, as the Nobel Committee said, for the development of a method for genome editing. And so I want to, I want to again highlight what is the novel and the, the revolutionary basically aspect of technology. So genome editing is very precise. So you make precise mutations at any positions in the genome. Whereas mutation breeding that I initially introduced to you actually alters the genome at random places. Yeah? In order to hit a certain target, you need many of them. So that's the big difference. Yeah? And I want to point out here again that this is not something that, of course, Jennifer Dutton and Emmanuel Charpentier discover, uh, developed. It's something that they discovered. It's a very old system. And this is the tree of life here showing bacterial diversity by genome sequencing. So the, the bacterial basically domain, oops, I go back, the RK, and then much later in evolution, of course, humans and plants that appeared on our planet. But the point I want to make is that CRISPR-Cas is found in, in around 50% of bacteria, which means it's a very old system yeah, before eukaryotes, before humans and, and plants were on this planet, approximately 3.5 billion years old. So it's an old system that has been established by nature and is now being used by breeders for something that, 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 that serves their, their, their breeding target, but it's not something that has been invented by humans, of course. And this is true for many different technologies, of course, which involves biotechnology. Yeah? I just wanted to make this point because I always find it interesting how lawmakers basically they define something's natural and something's not natural. This system is very natural. Yeah? Okay. So how does it work, actually? So the, the, the principle is actually is a, in a simplified cartoon. It's a two-component version, so genome editing as one component and genome editing is a single guide RNA. And this consists of two parts. There's a target specific sequence that you can use now to target this to any place in the genome, but you need the genome information. And then there's something that's called a tracer RNA, which has an interesting three-dimensional structure, which actually works like a key and block mechanism for nuclease. And this nuclease now is shown as, a, as this yellow potato here. This can nicely fit into the three-dimensional structure of the RNA. Yeah? And so this whole complex now can basically can, can screen DNA and lock down to places where the guide RNA fits exactly to the genomic sequence. Yeah? This is the principle. And then the Cas9 nuclease activity becomes active and will make a cut. And then there's many different possibilities or several different possibilities what the cell can do. But one important repair mechanism, it's an endogenous repair mechanism, is actually that the cut DNA is put together by a principle or by a mechanism that is called non-homologous enjoining. Yeah? And during this mechanism, often single bases are inserted, sometimes delete, uh, or deleted mostly, but sometimes also inserted or so. So there will be a small, actually, mutation precisely at the gene of interest, yeah, where you would guide your basically complex, your guide RNA Cas9 nuclease complex to. And um, okay, and so basically, what are the consequences? The consequences that you have basically, if you think about these chemical, physical induced mutagens such as cobalt sixty or EMS, depending on concentration and exposure time and 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 and, and closeness to the radiation source and so on, you sometimes breeders try to target between five and twenty thousand mutations. So you can say approximately thirty thousand mutations per genome induced by this uh, older technology, basically. And genome editing, it's only one, and you can verify this by genome sequencing. Yeah. And so basically, an interesting point of, of thought is also that if you bring a crop, any crop, any plant that you want, you bring to next generation, there will be also always natural mutations. Yeah? And you will have approximately 35 to 50 mutations per genome in each generation. Yeah? And to be real honest now, if a breeder uses genome editing, and then if you propagate the seeds, it will also induce this extra 35 to 50 Mutations, yeah, and this is based on on, on seminal work by Detlef Weigel's lab at the Max Planck and, and Tübingen that that made whole genome sequence in order to understand how many natural mutations actually. Have. 
Okay, so maybe to conclude, the all the genome edited plants have far fewer mutations than those obtained by chemical or physical mutagenesis. And even though these mutations cannot be distinguished from natural mutations, such crops are considered GMO in Europe. Yeah? And again, so basically, you could do now the same plant, and this has been actually also done successfully. That has been uh, so the sweet corn, for example, that has been uh, uh, achieved by mutation breeding, where you have many, many mutations that are undesirable, that you didn't want to have, that breeders didn't like or didn't, didn't aim for, let's say. But one mutation that then affects uh, synthesis, a gene involved in starch synthesis, starch synthesis, which then involves or results in the accumulation of sugars, which makes the sweet taste. Yeah. Now with genome editing, you can nicely induce just a single mutation without all the other unwanted mutations in order to get to the same very nice maize variety. And you can do this sweet corn variety. And you can do this now on any variety that is even locally adapted. You can make a sweet corn variety. You don't have to, to rely on this original radiation breeding experiment and then start crossing or so. But nonetheless, so the sweet corn, conventional sweet corn that we know that I guess many of you have tried is not considered GMO, whereas the, the targeted approach yeah, where you have just this one single mutation is considered GMO, at least in the, in, in the European Union. Now I want to give you three examples that I find interesting uh, that how actually genome editing can be nicely used yeah, to, 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 to improve breeding. And so one example is powdery mildew, plumeria criminis, which is a devastating disease in, in wheat. And uh, it has been known for quite some time this powdery mildew resistance can be induced by deactivating a certain gene, which is called the MLO gene. And I don't talk about this gene in more detail, but if it's deactivated, powdery mildew cannot anymore affect plants. This has been found by different methods, also classical methods and, and diploid uh, and, and plants, but it cannot be easily achieved in wheat because it's a wheat is a complex genome of three subgenomes. Yeah, so you would need to hit you would need to hit uh, all three copies of all three subgenes uh, genomes of the specific MLO gene in order to achieve your resistance. Yeah, and this is shown here. So it's difficult to target simultaneous three genes by conventional methods. If you think about mutation breeding, it's actually if you think about the probability, yeah, so many genes, three at the same time, you need to have such a mutagenesis rate that plants would not survive. It's impossible. Yeah? Now, um, this is shown here that you need to hit all three copies. Yeah? So a wild type plant that has not been undergone genome editing is susceptible. So you see the snowy fly-like appearance of this of this fungal pathogen. Yeah? If you knock out one copy of one so one MLO from one subgenome, yeah, it's not enough. You still have uh, susceptibility. You can do this with either of the subgenomes. You can make double knockouts. Yeah, it's not enough. You need to hit out. You need to hit and knock out by genome editing all three subgenomes in order to get resistance. Yeah, and these plants are so only we talk about three mutations, not thousand mutations. Yeah, these three mutations now will make plants basically resistant to Plumeria graminis, and they can be grown without the impact or without uh, uh, pesticide use in order to to, um, to, to prevent this, this, this disease. Yeah? So it's actually a very nice approach to, to minimize the chemical input into agriculture. Yeah? Um, and this can be done for, this could be done for many different species, including wine, for example, which has a huge problem of pathogen and fungal disease with, uh, uh, susceptibility, of course. Another example from also uh, from in this case from a colleague in Bonn also, Armin Jormi, the plant pathology, together with Jochen Kumlin at the IPK in Gattersleben. A similar approach, genome editing, to make a partial resistance against uh, smut resist, so smut disease and maize. And there's a different target here, lip oxygenase in this case, it doesn't matter, which again, yeah, can actually re nicely result in partially resistant plants that need less or no basically pesticide against this disease. Another third example that I want to bring is also from a colleague here in Bonn, Peter Dermann's lab, uh, which uh, nicely showed that you can knock out actually glycosinolate accumulation in Camelina sativa. Camelina, wild flux, is an is a old crop that has been grown in Nitholitic times already in Europe. It has actually been pushed away a little bit in its significance in agriculture by, by canola, by rapeseed, for different reasons. One of the reasons is that in canola, there has been in the 50s by, by, by classical breeding has been identified uh, plants uh, plants that have oil content without glycosinolate, so they're glycosinolate free or low, uh, they have low glycosinolate content, let's say. And this has actually then increased the, 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 the use of, of rapeseed and pushed also camelina a little bit on the side. And the difficulty with camelina is that similar to wheat, it has three subgenomes, it's a hexabreed organism. 
where you have to deactivate three copies at the same time, which is very difficult by classical methods, but very simple and, and very powerful, of course, with um, with uh, genome editing. And this has been done here, and these plants, while they cannot be grown in the European Union, uh, unless you have it without hurdles of GMO technology, they can ni nicely be grown, for example, in Canada and 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 and, um, and US, for example. And they have a lot of this advantage. So Camelina has a lot of advantages compared to canola, for example, with respect to oil quality, a lot of un polyunsaturated fatty acids, tocopherol as an antioxidant, and also a nice co a cover crop and so on. Something that, that, that I would be happy to discuss in more detail, why this actually is, is a really cool actually approach to do that. Now, the last example that I want to give is actually something that's called de novo domestication of a wild tomato. It's a very nice paper together with a colleague from Münster, Jörg Kuttler, where they were able with just six known domestication genes to basically use a wild tomato, Solanum pimpinellifolium, South America, to shortcut, if you wish, 2,000 years of domestication. Yeah? And so this is shown here. So basically by, by targeting specific genes that were known as domestication genes, they could alter fruit, uh, plant and fruit morphology. They could in, increase dramatically fruit number, uh, fruit size. They could increase also lycopene accumulation, so content uh, that is beneficial for human nutrition actually was increased. And so this is one example of several examples where people have actually now been able to use wild plants, wild progenitors, and went through, through domestication process very quickly with this precise genome editing tool. Yeah? And I think looking back and maybe reminding you of what I said before, that actually we are very selective actually in the number of species that we have and cultivate as, as crops today worldwide, actually, I think it's a very powerful tool to maybe think about uh, cultivating other plants also to increase the crop diversity that we, that we have today. Now, I want to make one point also here that while there is this positive overall positive development of decreasing undernourishment, there is still actually a problem also that there is something called hidden hunger, which affects many more people than, than, than just hunger. And so people, so the FAO estimates that around two to three billion people are affected by hidden hunger. Hidden hunger means it's a deficiency in micronutrients, mostly iron and zinc and iodine and vitamin A. And uh, and this deficiency affects many people. And, and I showed you one example here where you can improve nutrient content of crops. And that's something that I think also is, some, is, is, is actually could be and will be a very useful target of genome editing yeah? and something that, that we should take care of, uh, just we should be, be aware of. And so basically this shows just the, about the policy, the regulation, regulatory consideration. So in the European Union, genome editing is considered GMO technology, everything that is green here. So, which is most of the world, it's not considered, or um, yeah, most of, of, I don't want to say most of the world, it's, it's a big part of the world where it's not considered GMO technology, such as in Canada and US, for example, I showed this before. And so, why is this actually regulated differently? And this has to do with the, actually the way that the, the lawmakers in, in Europe and, and US, Canada basically look at this. Is it product based? Is it a product based view about the technology or a process based view? And in the process, you need this coding sequence for Cas9 and, and guide RNA, which will later be crossed out. So it's not anymore present in the final product, but it has been used. So basically the US, uh, the European Union sees this as a GMO technology, whereas in US and Canada, the statement is that um, you should not regulate a plant that could otherwise have been developed through traditional breeding techniques. It's undistinguishable from other breeding techniques. So there's no reason for them to, to regulate this. Yeah? And this actually creates also a lot of of course, problems if you think about exchange of breeding material. And that's also something that I'm happy to, to, to maybe discuss with you in the, after, this, after this seminar. So now I want to come to my last point, and this is actually how can we use this in, in, in plant physiology? And that's where my lab is personally mostly interested in. That's why we also start uh, genome editing on, on a larger scale now in my laboratory in order to understand gene to phenotype relationships. And I want to demonstrate, I want to show this again, what I showed you at the beginning, the flow of genetic information to show that environments have a strong impact impact on, on expression of certain genes. Yeah? And I want to pick out phosphorus. Phosphorus is an important macronutrient, but also a limited resource on our planet. So it's an important, basically, nutrient to think about in agriculture. If you look at plants that are, uh, have been exposed to phosphate deficiency versus phosphate sufficiency, you will see lots of changes. Yeah? And this is shown here. So you will get uh, probably 2,000 approximately, depending on, on crop species, uh, differentially regulated genes. Yeah? And they will result in many different metabolites. And it's always difficult in these kind of experiments to differentiate cause and consequence. Yeah? So what is actually causing adaptation, let's say, of a certain plant 
uh, to phosphate deficiency and what is just the consequence of phosphate deficiency. And of course, you would like to have for breeding purpose, but also for a better understanding of how plants deal with phosphate deficiencies, you would like to have the physiological relevant, basically genes and mRNAs and, and proteins, you would like to identify them in order to better understand how plants cope with phosphate deficiency. Yeah? And so this can be very difficult. And what you need actually is you need to have isogenic lines, which have only a difference in one particular gene that you want to test as a potential candidate for this phosphate homeostasis, let's say. Yeah? And this has been in the history in the past, yeah, before genome editing came around, basically, this has been done by large population that have, yeah, have been a concerted action of many different uh, research organizations in the US and Japan and in Europe and, and other parts of the world that rely on large uh, populations of, of or large DNA populations or in some cases also transposable elements, yeah, transposon populations, collections where you can find individual lines that have a certain knockout in, 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 in one or the other gene. Yeah? Now they have been, while this has been very important and crucial to understand plant physiology and, and gene phenotype relationships, there's also important disadvantages of these collections that, that have been established. And so first of all, not all yeah, non-essential genes are covered in these collections. Now second, often more, and this is actually the Sometimes the biggest problem, often more than one gene has been affected. Yeah, So you don't know if the two or three genes are affected in these populations, you know, what, what is causing actually the phenotypes that you then observe. And so basically, which is then maybe the most important reason and disadvantage of this technology is that only these tDNA and transposon collections are only available for certain model plants and, and major crops. But for many plants, they're not available. Yeah, And so now with this new technology, genome editing, where we can precisely deactivate a certain gene, we can nicely study gene phenotype relationships and also, of course, genetic networks then as a consequence of, of gene deletions. So this is actually, so genotype phenotype interactions are critical to identify changes that are physiological relevance and that can be actually now achieved with this new technology. And that's why actually all labs working in, in, in physiology, actually they implement these technologies in order to, to, to address these questions of genotype to phenotype relations. So let me come with this to the, and I'm sorry, I realize I'm, I'm late. With my time, so let me come to the conclusion. So, important advances in crop breeding since the beginning of the 20th century have helped to feed a growing world population. The definition of what is GMO and what is not is somewhat confusing and unfortunately not regulated consistently in different parts of the world. New breeding technologies can help to reach several of the SGDs, in particular to reduce the environmental impact, chemical footprint of agriculture, and to improve nutritional quality. I personally think we should think about the breeding target and be less judgmental about the technology, how to get there. And just please remember, there's always, at the end, there's always ACTG. That's the letters that we have, regardless of the breeding technology. Yeah? And so at the end, again, and I didn't have time to go in more detail there, genome editing is an excellent tool to investigate gene phenotype relations and crop physiology. In case you, have, you would like to have some more information on genome editing, I recommend to have a look at the web page of EUSH. EUSH is a network of scientists representing approximately 134 plant research institutions in Europe that try to provide more information on genome editing. Uh, there's a very nice database where you can look up a lot of examples of genome edited plants. I also like the webpage of Progressiva Agrarwende with also a very nice database. I think this is currently only in German. Of course, if there's any questions that remain after this discussion, I'm also happy if you contact me. My contact details are given below. Thanks again for listening. I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you very much.